I'm Kendall Almerico, crowdfunding and Jobs Act attorney, and I'm here today to talk to everyone about the Jobs Act and to explain to you things that relate to how the Jobs Act works so you'll understand the law itself as it relates to equity crowdfunding, but also, more importantly, so you'll understand as to the world of marketing, how it fits in. One of the things you have to know is a little bit about the law before you actually can apply the marketing to it because there are several different ways this law works and there are several different ways people will use the law. So I'm gonna go through all of that. Some of it may be a little bit technical and wonky. I'll answer questions later, but I'm gonna make it as uh, easy as possible because it's really not that complicated. And just by way of, you know, to prove that I really am kind of a big deal, um, you know, I'm one of the top crowdfunding and Jobs Act attorneys in the country, according to Forbes. Of course, I may well be the only Jobs Act and crowdfunding attorney in the country, <laughs> at least when they said that. But I've been recognized as an expert in this stuff for quite some time. I've known Roy for quite a while, and, and I'm here to try and educate you the best I can. But the reality is, that's me. Um, my little top hat, I still wear that suit every now and then. I've got 27 years experience helping people start and grow businesses, and that's not just as a lawyer. I've always been involved as an entrepreneur. I've always been involved in the marketing end of things. I get involved with people from the top to bottom when I get involved with their company. It's not just here's your legal documents and go away. I like to stay involved and be a part of everything because getting them funded is only part of the problem. You know, once you get that done, then there's a whole other world that needs to be taken care of. So um, let's start off, and everyone in this room knows what rewards crowdfunding is, but I'm going to use this as a very simple example first to start and talk about why crowdfunding and equity crowdfunding came to be, because this is something you may actually get asked at certain points in time. People historically are sometimes interested. So when the, you know, crowdfunding's been around forever. People have passed the hat at churches forever. That's crowdfunding. Um, the Statue of Liberty, the base of the Statue of Liberty was crowdfunded. Actually, Joseph Pulitzer was the editor of the New York World newspaper and famously went to his readers and said, we don't have money to put the Statue of Liberty on something. And, got 100,000 readers to give a dollar or less. They raised $125,000. They gave away a reward, a little Statue of Liberty to people. They actually did, like, like on Kickstarter. And they built the base. And, and it's been around for a long time, but it really hit its stride in 2007, 2000, or in response to 2007, 2008, when the country went through a financial crisis and banks simply stopped loaning money to people. Before 2007, in my practice for 20 years, I would, if Jessica came to me and said, I want to start a business, Kendall, and she gave me a business plan, and I liked it, and I signed on to be a part of it, I could go to any of the banks in Tampa where I lived, go to the bank president and say, Jessica needs a $100,000 line of credit to start her business. Now, Jessica doesn't have a house, she doesn't have collateral, but she has a great business plan, and I like it, I'm going to be a part of it, and they would write her a line of credit to be able to you know, start her business. I probably caused the entire financial crisis by doing that, but the reality is it was easy to get money from a bank. Once 2007, 2008 came around, banks stopped lending to everyone, and small businesses had no way to raise money initially. If they weren't VC funded or something else, they weren't getting money. Crowdfunding came out of that, interestingly. Indiegogo launched in 2008, Kickstarter launched in 2009, and they really hit their stride with, I like to tell the story of the $10,000 watch, um, that's a, a, Brightly, a Breitling Bentley. I happen to be wearing one right now. Um, mine cost $80. I bought it in Times Square from a guy in a little suitcase. But this is the $10 million watch, which we've all heard the story of the Pebble Watch. The Pebble Watch, of course, was one of the first really big Kickstarter rewards campaigns that kind of put Kickstarter on the map. So you started reading about crowdfunding and you started reading about these types of rewards crowdfunding campaigns in the, in the news, the Wall Street Journal covered it, all the big press covered it, because all of a sudden a company had gone out and done what you guys do all the time. They raised money for something that doesn't exist, a product that is going to be made, you were pre-ordering a product, and they raised $10 million doing this. for a, it, 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 when I first heard about this, and I was trying to explain this to people, you know, I, I just always picture trying to explain this to like my grandmother if she were still around. Grandma, you're going to send $150 to this company for a watch they haven't made yet, and then in six months, if they figure out how to do it and make it, they're going to send you the watch. It, her head would have exploded, you know, and, and so this concept was very foreign to people. However, it started to catch on, and as a result, the successes in the rewards world, people like me who were lawyers started going, 
why can't we start selling securities like this? If you can get people to send you $150 to buy something, why can't they send you $150 for a couple shares of stock in your company? Well, they can't. It was blatantly, totally illegal. For 80 years in the United States, the securities laws said you're not allowed to sell securities to the general public online. You're not allowed to advertise that you're selling securities unless you're a publicly traded company. So those companies you see in the New York Stock Exchange or you know those kinds of companies, they can do it. But private companies couldn't. And so this, the whole thing started as a result of this. And I'm going to give you an example of a company that I represent right now that's about to do an equity crowdfunding campaign to kind of illustrate how it can work and how it's a little different than doing something on Kickstarter. So BrewDog is a client of mine. In about seven to 10 days, they're going to launch their first equity crowdfunding campaign in the United States. But there's already equity crowdfunding going on in the UK. Their law went into effect at about the same times as the US laws. However, the US laws didn't get put into effect by the SEC for over three and a half, four years. So the law was passed, but you couldn't use it. In the UK, the law got passed and people were allowed to use it. BrewDog has done four equity crowdfunding offerings over the last four years and has raised 26 million pounds from 46,000 investors using their law. They went from two guys and a dog in the back of a pickup truck to now the largest craft brewery in all of Europe. They have 44 brew pubs that are from Sao Paulo to Tokyo, all of which are profitable. They employ over 600 people, and they are the fastest growing food and drink company in the UK the past four years straight. That all started with equity crowdfunding. They didn't raise a dime from venture capitalists or equity or angel investors. It all shows how this can work. So they're about to do one here in the United States. It's going to be what we call a Regulation A offering, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So they're going to use this to build their own brewery here in Columbus, Ohio, which, by the way, is now 80% done. Uh, they don't really, they're raising the money to not only finish it, which they'll finish it without the money, but they're building this thing because they want to take their beer, which when you, anybody who doesn't know about craft beer, a little education. Craft beer is not like buying Miller beer or buying Budweiser. There's no preservatives in it. It's not built to last on store shelves. You can't ship it somewhere, sell it six months later. It has about a 90-day shelf life, max, because there's no preservatives. So they would take their beer from the UK. They were in Whole Foods and all over the United States. They would ship it to the United States. It would sit in the port. And by the time it got through customs and it got onto trucks and got to the stores, half of the shelf life was gone. These guys are master brewers. These are not jokers that just you know, decided to do this. Three of the top 11 master Cicerones, which is ultimately the same thing as a sommelier, you know, three of the 11 work for Brewdog. So these guys are very serious about their beer. They didn't like the way their beer tastes in the United States. So they said, we, it's the biggest market. We're going to go into that market. We're going to build our own brewery, which is twice the size of their brewery in the UK. They're going to employ three or 400 people the day it opens in the UK, and they're going to fund the entire thing through equity crowdfunding. So it's just a great example of how this stuff can work. You know, and it's on a scale that can be much, much larger than anything that can be done on Kickstarter. So what's the Jobs Act? The Jobs Act, interestingly enough, people look at this and say, oh, it must have something to do with jobs. Jobs Act stands, it's actually an acronym for the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act. And this is the law that legalized equity crowdfunding in the United States. It was signed into law on April 5th, 2012, after passing through Congress, both sides of Congress, bilateral support, very few people objected to it. The brilliance of this law is that it really was like seven different laws crammed into one that don't make a lot of sense to each other, and I'll talk about some of those in a minute. But they put it all under this heading called the Jobs Act. There was a congressional staffer who named it because they were having trouble getting support for this in Congress because there were all these different weird laws that didn't make sense together. Congressional staffer said, if we call it the Jobs Act and come up with something that has the word jobs in it, everyone's going to vote for it. And that's how it ended up being come, be called the Jobs Act, even though, as you'll see, the parts we're going to talk about today, three different laws, all of which involve equity crowdfunding, all of which have totally different rules that make no sense together. All right, and that's where it gets complicated for our, all you guys. So there's three different parts of it we're going to talk about today. There's Title II, Title III, and Title IV, and I'll talk about those specifically one at a time here so you have an understanding of what they are, actually are. Title II was the first part of the JOBS Act to go into effect, and Title II is also known as a private placement. 
Regulation D, Section 506C. These are all the magical terms people use, but I call it accredited investor crowdfunding. And what you're allowed to do with a Title II offering is you can raise money, but only from accredited investors. And accredited investors are people that qualify. They have to either make $200,000 a year in income, have a net worth of over a million dollars, or with their spouse, have over $300,000 a year in income. So you're talking about a limited number of people. They have to prove that they have the money. They have to prove that they meet this criteria, or they're not allowed to invest in these deals. It's been legal since September of 2013. There's actually been about $70 billion go through this method of raising money since it happened, which is a lot of money, but a fraction of the money that actually goes through the private placement world at this time. But the big thing that this law did, and it opened the doors to the other things that you guys will do a lot more of, although you know, I'm sure you're involved in some of these before. I know Roy and I have worked on a couple. Um, the big part about this law was it was the first securities law ever to allow general solicitation for private companies. That means you're allowed to advertise. General solicitation simply means you can market and advertise. It was 80 years of, that's totally illegal. If you sent an email to somebody saying, I'm selling, my, selling stock, your company had violated securities laws. If you took an ad out, a press release saying you're selling stock as a private company, those were all violations that could get you in a lot of trouble with the SEC. This was the first part of the Jobs Act that said, hey, we live in 2012. Uh, people advertise online. People have social media. Let's let them use it. And so this opened the door for the things that we'll talk about later, but this was the first law that ever allowed general solicitation. What's interesting about this law is you can raise as much money as you want. There is no limit. You, if you wanted to go out and try and raise a billion dollars, you can raise a billion dollars through a private placement. There's no cap on it. Accredited investors can invest as much money as they want. If they want to put in 10 million, 20 million, 30 million dollars, they can invest anything they want because the theory is they're rich so they're smart enough to know if it's a bad deal. That's the theory behind it. All right? You'll realize as we go into these other ones that the Congress and the SEC seem to think that anyone who's not rich isn't smart enough to figure out what to do and is just going to throw all their money away on some horrible investment. So they put in all kinds of caps and things like that. So Title III, or as we call it, the True Equity Crowdfunding Law, or Regulation CF, it's been in effect for now almost 60 days. So the law was passed in 2012. Four years, five months, and six days later, but who's counting, the SEC finally made it legal to actually use this law, literally two months ago. I waited that long for this law to go into effect. It's exactly like going on Kickstarter. It looks just like a Kickstarter campaign. The only difference is, instead of you saying pushing a button and donating, you push a button that says, I'm investing. And when you go into the checkout process, you're not allowed to use credit cards. It's not legal to use credit cards to buy securities. So you have to either wire the money, write a check, tip, type in your uh, bank account information and ACH the money. They're just starting to let people use debit cards, which just happened in the last week, literally. But ultimately, it's almost the exact same thing as going on you know, Kickstarter and doing something. Anyone can invest. So under these the Title III rules, anyone can invest, not just accredited investors. You're limited to raising a million dollars as a company under this law. So there's a cap. You know, you can only raise a million dollars. And the most important thing is it's very much like a Kickstarter campaign in that it is an all or nothing campaign. So when you do a Title III campaign, if you set a goal and don't hit your goal, you don't get any of the money. I'm going to show you or talk to you about some of the examples of the early stages of people doing this wrong, which you guys already know from dealing with Kickstarter before. Very, very important part of the process is setting a goal that's reachable. You know, but the difference is, if you screw up in Kickstarter, the eh, worst thing that happens is some people get mad at you and you know, maybe you, some attorney general somewhere might come after you for false advertising, but that rarely ever happens. Here, when you set a goal, you better be able to do with that goal money what you say you're going to do if you're a company. So if you go in and say, I need to build a brewery, and I need $500,000 to build a brewery, you've got to set a minimum of $500,000. You can't say, I have to build a brewery, I'm going to raise $25,000 right now, and then hopefully I'll somehow get the other money and build a brewery. If you do that, you are going to get sued by a whole lot of people, and you are going to get an enforcement action by the SEC, which can include criminal charges. So you wouldn't be making those decisions, but when companies talk to you about this, it's a little bit more dangerous on the all or nothing. I encourage clients to set their number as low as possible and then create what we call a use of proceeds, where you tell people we're going to use this money for X, Y, and Z. 
but make it something you can do with that money. You know, don't say, I have to build a brewery. If you need $500,000 to build a brewery, you say, we're going to raise $50,000 or $25,000, and that's going to be used for X. But if we get to $100,000, we're going to use that for Y. If we get to $500,000, we're going to build a brewery. You know, and as long as you do it that way, you're okay. Title IV, this is my favorite part of the Jobs Act. So this is Regulation A, or Regulation A+, plus. they actually mean the same thing, the mini IPO. This went into effect last year in June. Again, it looks exactly like a Kickstarter campaign or an Indiegogo campaign online. Anyone can invest in the general public. There's a limit of $50 million you can raise with this law, not $1 million. And it's not all or nothing. So if you want to raise $20 million, but you only raise $10 million, you get to keep it if you're a company. So you're probably sitting there looking at these two going, well, why in the hell would anybody use Title III? It makes no sense. This law is clearly better, clearly more, you know, everything about it is better. The problem is it costs a small fortune to do this. Title III costs not a lot to do. There's a lot of regulation that goes with this that you don't have with Title III. So we'll talk about some of those things later because if it were, if the JOBS Act were just, here are three different ways to do it and all the rules are the same, nobody would use anything but this. <laughs> there would be no reason to. However, this is the hardest one from a legal standpoint, an accounting standpoint, a cost standpoint to do. Good news for you guys, all the marketing is the same for any of these things. You know, and we'll talk a little bit about Title II, which is a little different, but the ones where you're going to the general public, what you've been doing for Kickstarter campaigns or Indiegogo campaigns is the same. It's not going to change. You're still trying to do the same types of things, build a crowd, get people excited, get press for the thing, drive people to a certain page to invest, all the things you already do, building social media. None of that's going to change, except you have to follow new rules that you have to deal with, which we're gonna talk about, and you will want to take notes when we get to that part, because I even have to look at these things now and go, oh, a little scary. So, this is just an example of what a page would look like. It doesn't look much different. This is what BrewDog's page want, will look like you know, when it launches in seven days. The only difference is I wanted you to see the Invest Now button. So pretty much every site has a button that says Invest Now instead of Donate. Um, but they all pretty much look the same when you get them online. With Title III, this is something that's kind of interesting, so I, I wanted to point it out. This is a live offering on a, a site called WeFunder right now, which is sort of taking the lead in the Title III world. So Title III, again, up to a million dollars that you can raise from anybody in the public. One of the things that Title III requires is that you have to have a communication section on the site where people can communicate with the company. So people can post questions, you can have a chat room, you can have a question and answer. However you do it, it's required by law. And as marketing people who are involved in this, this is going to become a very important part of what you do. Because the only place a company is allowed to communicate back and forth with investors about an offering is on the actual website. All right? So this is the place where everything has to be public. You've got, you're going to have a whole list of people making comments. And guess what? If you go on as the company's you know, marketing firm and you post some things, oh, this is great, I love this, this is wonderful, you just committed a giant securities law violation. Any communications that are done on here by the company have to be identified as coming from the company. So you have to say, I'm the president of the company and I'm posting this. You can't say, or I'm the neighbor of the president of the company. Any relation you have to disclose. This is very important because as marketing people, you know, as we all know, people like to post negative things. And this was the very first comment on, <laughs> which I thought was great, so that's why I picked this. Very first comment for this Legion M offering that's going on right now on WeFunder. It's, I don't understand what happens after investment. Everything is very vague. I'd like to know 100% of what my investment is getting me imagine this is going to be very common. So I would imagine one of the things you guys will want to do is come up with a you know, pretty standard Q&A with your clients, make sure that you have things that address the common questions that people would have. But this is an opportunity to sell also. You know, you take that question, you turn it into a positive. Oh, now that you asked, here's what you get. You know, so it's a great opportunity to address problems publicly. And like many people use Twitter as their customer service now, it's, you know, it's all public, so use it. You know, use it as a positive. Who can invest? So each of these laws is different, and I'm gonna go through a few slides here where I go through each of the laws and talk to you so you can kind of see how they all work together. So who can invest in a Title II private placement? Again, Title II is the 
you know, just to the accredited investors, people in the general public, not allowed to invest. What does that mean? If you go to a site that's running a private placement, a Title II private placement, you have to check a button, a little box, before you're allowed to even see most of the offering. You can see a little bit of it, but if you actually want to invest and see the documents, you have to check a box that says, I'm telling you I'm an accredited investor, to be able to even see it. Then, once you decide to invest and you're checking out in the process and saying, I'm putting this money in, you actually have to be verified. You know, there's an independent process that takes place behind the scenes to make sure you're an accredited investor. That I won't go into all the details, but that all happens behind the scenes on these websites. If you're not an accredited investor, you're not allowed to invest at all. With Title III and Title IV, with the million dollar and the $50 million, anyone can invest. There are some limits on what you can invest that we'll get into. And this is my most complicated slide. I actually put an arrow in just to be as complicated as possible. But let's talk about the easy one first. Title II, accredited investors can invest as much as they want, as little as they want. There's no limits whatsoever on what they can invest. With Title III, the one that goes up to a million dollars, it's a complicated formula. I actually have to read it every time to figure it out. Now, on the sites, this will all get taken care of automatically. How much do you make? What's your net worth? How much do you want to invest? You're allowed to invest $100. You know, it'll tell them. But the reality is there's two different categories. If you have an annual income or net worth of less than $100,000, you can invest 5% of the lesser of the two or $2,000. I, I, it's just like I need an abacus and a Venn diagram to keep this trip. Yeah. And if you, make, oh, if, you, if you actually have a net worth and income over, both over $100,000, you're allowed to invest up to 10% of whichever is less. Again, don't try and memorize this. I just keep a little chart on my desk because I can't remember it. Um, Regulation A, mini IPO, the one you can raise up to $50 million. There's no limit on accredited investors. By the way, in Title III, that applies to accredited investors also. So even though you're smart and sophisticated and a billionaire, you can only invest a certain amount of money in a Regulation A offering. You're limited to what you can invest. In Title, F Title IV, when you're doing the mini IPO, accredited investors can invest as much as they want, but everyone else is limited to, pretty simple formula, 10% of your income or net worth is the max you're allowed to invest. Again, that's all done on the site. How much can you raise? In a Title II offering, private placement from accredited investors, there's no limit. Whatever you're, you can raise, you're allowed to raise. Title III, it's a million dollars. Title IV, it's $50 million. I put a little star, a little asterisk there because there's actually two parts of Title IV. There's a part where you can go on a local level and just stay in one or two states and the law is a little different. In that one, you're capped at $20 million. But most people don't use that. If you ever get into a situation where somebody is using that, it's a different world altogether. It's actually very useful for certain things, but most people are shying away from it and just going to the, the $50 million cap. Is it all or nothing? Again, the only one that's all or nothing here is Title III, the million dollar one. Now the reason I put the asterisk next to the other two is the thing I said before. You can pretty much make a private placement or make a, a mini IPO into all or nothing because if you really have a minimum in your offering, look, I gotta raise $500,000 or I can't keep the money, you sort of de facto create your own minimum. But the reality is most people that have good lawyers don't do that to figure out a way around it so that they can keep the money that they raised from the very beginning. SEC, all right, what do you have to do with the SEC? What do you have to file? This probably isn't all that important to what you do, but it's, it's good to know because you will get questions from people that ask you about, well, do I have to file something with the SEC and you know, all that. You, there's really lawyer questions to do, but there's a specific form for each one of these that gets filed. So with the private placement, there's something called Form D, which you don't file in advance. You file once you've gotten your first check-in from somebody, the first investment, then you file a simple two-page form that anybody, a third grader, could fill out that says, we got our first money in, and then you never file another thing. The SEC just wants some record that you're raising money, but it's totally private. There's no disclosures, none of your records, no, nothing is in the public record for you. Title III, on the other hand, you file a Form C, and Title IV, you file what's called a Form 1A, both of which are extensive forms that give a lot of details about your company, all of your financial records, a lot of that stuff is all public record, and both of those have to be filed with the SEC and qualified by the SEC, meaning the SEC has to kind of check off, yeah, you filed this and all the paperwork is here. They don't actually approve what you're doing. They don't say, yeah, this is okay, we like it. You know, they just say, in fact, it's a felony to say that the SEC approved 
any of these offerings. But the SEC says, yeah, you filed all the paperwork, you did it right, check box off, now you're allowed to go raise money. Ongoing SEC filings. So after you've raised money, you don't have to file anything if it's a private placement, just that one form and nothing else. With the other two, with Title III, a company has to file an annual report every year. And with Title IV, they have to file a lot of stuff. It's almost like being a public company. It's cheaper, not as much, but there's still quite a bit of compliance ongoing. You know, if there's a change in management, you have to file something. If there's, you know, you change the auditors for your company, you have to file something. Twice a year, you have to file audited financial records. It can be a very expensive process to do. <sighs> Speaking of expensive, least expensive, not too expensive, and very expensive. The reason I say that is, Across the board here, with the exception maybe of Title II, the marketing expenses really don't change. You know, the marketing is the marketing. It's, it's always going to be a huge piece of all of these. But I'm talking here about legal, accounting, compliance, all the things you have to do to just start the process. Typical private placement, you can probably get going for about $25,000, maybe less. Typical Title III, depending on what you're doing, if you have to get some financials done, it's probably less than that, but it's probably about the same amount when it looks at it. Title IV, typically, if people don't have a budget of in the six-figure range, they can't afford to do it. So between the legal fees, the compliance costs, they have to get two years of audited financial records, which in and of itself could cost thirty dollars or $40,000. It's a very expensive process to go through, but you can also raise $50 million. So. What's the role of marketing? In the private placement world, I'm saying it's not as important. It's important, but I'll talk about that in a second. It's incredibly important the other two. When I meet with clients, the first thing I talk to them about is not the legal part, the compliance part, the SEC. The first thing I talk to them about is marketing. Because if they don't understand that this is all about marketing, they're not going to succeed. And I make that very clear from the very beginning. When somebody comes into me and they say, I want to go raise money, they don't come in and say, I want to do a private placement or I want to do a equity crowdfunding. They just say, I want to raise money. And I vet their process and see what it is they have. But the things I look for are, do you already have a crowd? Same things you guys look for. Do you already have a big following on social media? Do you already have a bunch of customers? Oh, you're a startup. You don't have anything. Well, if you don't have anything, you're going to have to hire someone, command partners, to come in and build the crowd for you. Because if you don't, where is this money going to come from? And people in the traditional investment world will look back at like, you know, we all hear about the IPOs, Facebook IPO, you know, they raised $14 billion, whatever it is, I don't even know what the numbers are. IPOs are driven by investment banks. So the investment banks out there, the Goldman Sachs of the world and those people, they come in, they guarantee a certain amount is going to be sold, they create the market, they go to their 100,000 brokers around the country and say, sell this for us. Nobody's doing that for anybody here, okay? You as a company and you as marketers are the ones who are creating the people who are going to invest. So a lot of people will come in thinking, oh, there's, you know, I just create a stock and all of a sudden people are going to show up and start, it's just like Kickstarter. If you build it, they will come. People think, I'm going to put this on Kickstarter and all of a sudden people are going to come in and start, no. It's the exact same thing. Now the reason I say it's not as important in Title II, it's a little different in importance because in Title II, where it's a private placement and you're just looking for accredited investors, it's a lot harder as a marketing company to say, I'm going to go out and find very, very rich people and just market to them. You know, if you put out a press release, if you get an interview with a, a newspaper or a broadcast source, yeah, you're going to hit those people. But it's really hard to target the people. And it's a little different story because those people, and when I say those people, I'm talking about accredited investors, I, for example, get 20 or 30 private placements sent to me a week. Just, there are thousands of these things out there, people trying to raise money from accredited investors. I don't even open them. Delete, 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 delete. Now, if someone I know, if Roy sends me one and goes, Kendall, this one's kind of interesting. I'm thinking about investing in it. I'll open that one. If it's not a personal recommendation or someone who I know, I just delete them all. If I saw an ad for one, man, would it have to be compelling for me to even <laughs> look at it. Wow, that's an interesting company. I mean, it's, we get bombarded with opportunities to invest in these companies. So the more marketing you do, the marketing really should be for those more of a branding marketing, you know, where you get people excited about it, where you're helping them build their company also. But doing stuff that would pique the interest of people, make it look unique to an accredited investor, as opposed to the other ones where you got to do all that, but 
you can spray it out there like buckshot and get as much as you can and then target people with you know, Facebook and, and all the other things. So Title II is a little different in the marketing world than everything else. <coughs> so here's where you need to take some notes. All right, we're gonna talk about the minefield of marketing and equity crowdfunding. And you, you guys obviously have a copy of this to be able to look at, but and anytime you have any questions, feel free to call me about this. But specifically what I wanna do is talk about, let's talk about the easy ones first. All right, Title II, when you're just going to accredited investors, you're allowed legally to generally solicit. So you can do anything. You can run ads, you can you know, go over to the stadium and have a plane drag something behind it, you can do smoke signals, you can do whatever you want. There's no limits on it, as long as the co it's not false or misleading. All right? But keeping in mind, when you're doing this advertising, you guys are advertising for the sale of securities. So unlike, you know, hey, we've got this really cool product, and it's the best product in the world, and it really works phenomenally great, because when you buy this, it's gonna change your life. You start saying that about a security, you know, hey, we're selling stock, it's the greatest stock in the world, you're gonna triple your money, you're gonna quadruple, you're gonna become a billionaire. You have to be very careful to not over-promise and be misleading, because the one thing that can happen in any kind of securities, you know, the SEC will come in and say, this is just false and misleading. And what they mean is, you exaggerated. So. Stick to being truthful, stick to being not misleading in any way. If it looks like it might be misleading, don't do it. Things you could probably pull off with a product on Kickstarter, you gotta think twice. If anybody looks at you and goes, hmm, that looks a little, you know, that's, that's the best product in the world? You know, you gotta be really careful about those things. Regulation A plus, the mini IPO, where you can raise up to $50 million again. You can generally solicit, you can advertise, you can do whatever you want, same rules as what we just talked about, but there's one thing that, that's a little different about this one, and there's a provision called testing the waters. So before you launch the campaign to raise the money, so this is only before, once the campaign is launched, same rules as everything else, you can do whatever you want as long as you're not false and misleading. Before you launch the campaign, anything you do to advertise or to do lead generation, which is a typical part of the process, it's called testing the waters. There's part of this law that basically says, before you go spend all the money hiring lawyers and everything, you can go out, create a splash page, go on a website, and see if there's interest in what you're doing. If people all of a sudden come to you and say, we want to invest, and you get millions of people coming saying they want to invest, okay, I'll go spend the money to do this. It's a great provision, although, as a practical matter, it really doesn't work. Because who's gonna find this on some website to determine if they want to, you know, you have to spend the same money to market to get people to the testing the waters page. Well, if you're gonna do that, you might as well have done it to send them to the page when you're live where you can actually keep the money. Here on a testing the waters page, people are just going there and, you know, they hire you guys and they spend, you know, thousands of dollars and you drive a bunch of people to a page that, yeah, I'm, I'll give you $100 in six months when the SEC approve, you know, goes through the process. My personal feeling is they shouldn't do a lot of that. However, Keeping in mind, if you're doing any pre-marketing, lead page generation, anything like that, there's a simple legend, a little paragraph disclaimer that you put at the bottom of every page, every email, everything that's approved by the SEC. The exact wording goes on there. As long as that's on there, you can do this, all right? So there's the testing the waters legend that you have to put on every page. As long as you do that, you're totally clear. Now, we're gonna talk about the scary one. Title III is really, scary when it comes to marketing. Up until about a week ago, when I got some new information from talking to some people at the SEC and talking to some colleagues of mine, there were a lot of attorneys out there who were saying, you cannot do any marketing whatsoever, not just about what's coming, but even for your company in general, because the SEC may come in if you do it before you do a crowdfunding offering and say, you are doing this to promote your crowdfunding offering and it's not legal. And there were people that said that. I wasn't one of them, but there were very smart people saying, you can't do anything to market your company when you're getting ready to launch a campaign. So I'm gonna go through this with you. This is the, the important part, because these Title III things are brand new. No one's really doing them yet, but when you start getting them, you've got to follow these rules. And keep in mind, we're only 60 days into this. There's no precedent. Some of the stuff I'm gonna tell you right now, there's nothing in writing. These are things I've been told by the SEC. These are things that I'm interpreting as to how I would feel comfortable having a, a company do it, but a lot of this could change. So I, I do wanna walk you through it though, because it's very important. So that yellow language that says, that's the law itself. 
So the Jobs Act itself actually says an issuer, and an issuer is just the company raising money, an issuer may not advertise the terms of the offering except for notices which direct investors to the funding portal or broker. So when you read that, you're thinking, what am I allowed to do? Nothing. All I can do is say, um, go look at the place where it's all online and read it there. And you can do whatever you want on that page, by the way. I mean, once you're on the funding portal, you can, that's fine. You can have the videos and everything there. But how do you get people there? Well, the first time I read that, I went, you can't. You literally can't do anything other than just say, go look on here. I'm not even sure if you could say we're raising money. You know, it's, it's really a kind of a scary thing to look at. So what it's kind of evolved into is two different things. And you have to analyze this when somebody comes in as to what can you do before you launch a campaign and after. That's the step number one. And number two is, are you going to be discussing the terms of the offering and what you're doing to market? I'm going to go through this very detailed so you'll understand it. <clears throat> so pre-launch, before you launch, what can you not do? All right. Number one, you can't do anything that the SEC would consider to be an offer. So you can't send something out that says, hey, we're going to raise money. We want you to invest in this. It's coming soon. Go look at this page. We're going to give you information about it. Anytime you sort of tell people you're going to be selling something, that the SEC considers to be an offer. Okay, so you have to be very careful about the wording you use pre-launch. Any communication that's made before you file the paperwork, no, that's the, basically the same thing, the same, same thing there. Now, keep in mind, this only applies to Title III. All right, this doesn't apply to the other ones. This only applies to that $1 million new law. No meetings with potential investors. You cannot sit down with somebody and say, hey, uh, this is going to be coming. Would like you to invest on day one. Boy, can you guys, we, we really want to hit 25 or 30% of our goal on day one. Can you come in and make sure you cannot do any of that? Can't talk to them, can't communicate with them. No sneak peeks or first looks. Hey, here's the page that we're going to launch in a couple of weeks. Just want you to see what it looks like. Can't do that. No public announcements about it. You can't send out a press release and say, next week we're launching this. You can't even call the journalists up and say, next week we're launching this. You're not allowed to do any of that. Last one, no discussions at a conference or demo day about the intentions to do a crowdfunding offering. So in other words, if you're out there at a demo day, demo, someone's demoing the product or something, you can't say, oh, by the way, next week we're launching a funding campaign. You can do the demo day. You just can't talk about the facts. So, Pretty much the general rule is, before the thing launches, you really can't do much, all right? So keeping in mind, a lot of what you do in the rewards world that you've built the way that you do your business practices on, you cannot do here right now. Now, these laws will probably change, but the one thing you have to keep in mind is you will be able to do all the things you did. You're just going to have to do it after the launch happens. <clears throat> Pre-launch, what can you do? So first thing you do is you can have all the communications you want as long as they don't mention the offering. You can do your normal advertising, your normal marketing of the business, your normal building of social media. You just can't do it saying we're about to launch a crowdfunding campaign. There's nothing to prevent you from doing that. Up until a week ago, there were literally lawyers that said you couldn't even do that, which was absurd. Prior to filing the form C, and this is the magic one that, that you have to kind of think about when you're helping craft messages. There's this term called conditioning the market. So when you guys go out on a Kickstarter campaign and you build a crowd, that's conditioning the market. You're actually building the market. You're getting people ready to invest. Anything that could be seen as you creating a crowd or getting people ready to invest in any kind of communication, publicity, whatever, that's a problem. Okay, you cannot do that. <clears throat> Regular marketing and advertising is okay. And the SEC has made it pretty clear to me that you can have conversations amongst yourselves. Like People can come in and talk to you about, we're going to do this offering and create things, and they can talk to their lawyers. They can even kind of look and build things that they want to do. They just can't, and it's okay if you later on even invest in the product or the, the company. But what you can't do is you can't do that type of thing purely for the purpose of having someone invest. All right, <clears throat> what are the terms of the offering? This is the magic thing that these four things you definitely need to know, all right? Because the difference of what you can market and cannot market, all this is after the launch, after the campaign's out there. If any of these four things are in what you create as marketing materials, you have a totally different set of rules. If none of these are in what you're creating, you can pretty much do whatever you want after you launch. All right. So it's the amount of, offer of securities offered. So in other words, you know, we're selling 500,000 shares. 
the nature of the security of common stock in our company, the price of the securities for $30 a share, and the closing date of the offering. It's gonna, this is available until July 30th, 2017. Those four things are considered the terms of the offering by law. If you don't put those in what you're doing, you can do pretty much whatever you want after you launch, all right? So those are very, very important. And this is not an area where I would like go, well, you know, the amount offered, you know, we're really not talking about the amount offered if we talk about the number of shit. Don't, don't play games with this. You know, if it sounds, if it looks like a duck and smells like a duck, this is a duck. Stay away from it. Don't, don't do something stupid here. So if you're not going to mention those four things in terms of the offering as, you know, marketing company, you can market, you can amcret, whatever that means. You can market whatever way you want to as long as it's truthful. All the different things that you guys do, you can do. There's no problem with that. One of the other things to keep in mind is whatever you do on the funding portal itself, the site where this is live, that can have whatever you want. Videos, pictures, all of those things. You can do all of those things on social media, all of those things in advertising, as long as you're not mentioning the terms of the offering after it's launched. Now, if you want to mention the terms of the offering, we get into what we call the tombstone ad. All right? For anybody who's ever seen typical securities related things, there's something called a tombstone ad that's a classic example of one where it's this boring as hell, white on black, Chrysler Corporation, a division of American Motors, raised a million dollars from such and such a bank. Very, very basic, simple information. What the SEC has said and what the law says is, if you want to mention the terms of the offering, you have to do a tombstone ad. That's what you have to put on Facebook. That's what you have to <laughs> put on the scoreboard at the stadium. A tombstone ad. So no one's going to do this. You know, just the reality is, why do it? You know, do your normal marketing, send them to the website where they can have all the information about the terms of the offering and they can, you know, invest. Just do your marketing. Hey, we're selling stock. You don't have to say how much. You don't have to say when it ends. You don't have to say what kind. You know, we're selling stock. Go to fundingportal.com and check out the, the details. All of that is okay. Beautiful video, fun graphics, whatever you want to do. All of that's okay. But if you want to do the terms of the offering, you have to do a tombstone ad. All right, so just don't use the terms of the offering. It's a really simple, simple process. And so I put in some of this little thing, you know, from the actual law that says what you can put into a tombstone ad. I'm not going to go through all the boring, you know, details, but basically, it's things like, you know, factual information. You're also allowed to put, like, the name of your company in. Um, one of the things that's in the law, it says a brief description of your business you're allowed to put into the tombstone ad. So you could kind of say something like, we're a, mar we're a digital marketing firm. But you wouldn't be able to say, we're the best digital marketing firm, and our success rate is, you know, X, and we've raised a zillion dollars for people. Brief means brief. Again, my advice would be, don't mess with this. Stay away from the terms of the offering and you're okay. So, a few tips and tricks of things that, these are, right now, my opinion, okay? This is based on conversations I've had, this is based on my research, this is based on what I tell clients today, July 11th, 2016. Tomorrow, I may have a conversation with an examiner at the SEC and change some of these things, okay? This is a very fluid situation, all right? So. My disclaimer, don't rely on my legal advice on this, but this is what I'm doing right now, and I think it gives you a good basis of ways to look at this, all right? So after the launch, after the, you're, you know, you're live, it looks like you can talk off the funding portal about the offering as long as you don't mention the terms of the offering. So what I told you before, I think you can use every tool in your, in your trick, you know, everything you have, I think you can do that, and I tell people they can. In all communications, there's only one place you can link, okay? This is very important. You always want to have whatever link you have go to the offering page and no place else. You do not want to link people to your website and then have a little splash page on your website that, you know, your own little glorified offering page that then go, or anything like that. You don't want to link that. One of the things that I'm very curious about, and this is, you know, the third one here. So you guys are in the business of obviously generating publicity. So let's say you get a wonderful story written about somebody in USA Today. Great story about the offering. The journalist does a bang up job. Awesome. You're so excited about it. You got this great placement for a client. But the journalist puts some of the terms of the offering into the story. They're selling 800,000 shares of common stock. If the journalist says that in the story, you cannot link to that story, period. You, 
basically can't use the story to market. Now, that's the problem. So controlling the message, especially in your press releases, to stay away from those terms of the offering, and maybe even kind of educating some of the journalists when you're talking to them about, look, it would be really helpful if you didn't mention these four things, because if you do, you know, it kind of hurts the business. And you know, most people, journalists, you know how they are. They either will say yes or they don't listen to you. But part of the process is trying to make sure journalists don't use the terms of the offering, because if they do, you can't do it. <clears throat> and then I did put down there, obviously, don't put the terms of the offering in a press release. I think I've, if I've beaten one thing into your heads already, it's don't talk about the terms of the offering. So last three of this is, if you're running a tombstone ad, as I said before, stick to the very uh, strict language you have to do. Don't vary from it at all. If you're going to do something, and, and let, me, let me talk about this middle thing in a, in a second because I think it's kind of important. So a lot of people have, and I think this is going to become sort of the way people do this. You want people that come to your website, your comp not when I say your, if you're a company raising money, you want people that come to your website naturally to find out about this offering, all right? But you can't really talk about the terms of the offering on your website. So things we might do with a Regulation A offering or a private placement where we might have, hey, learn about investing in our company now, click here. Got to be really careful. And I think my personal opinion and what I've been advising clients to do on this is create a splash page at the front of your website. You know, almost like when you go to an alcohol site, it's like, what's your age? Click here and then you can go in. Create a, a simple splash page at the beginning that says, are you interested in learning about our offering? You know, we're, we are raising money through a Title III offering. Are you interested in learning about this? This is after you're live. Click here. If they click there, they're taken to the offering page where everything is. If it says no, then they come into your website. I'm very concerned about creating pages within the website because if you create a page within the website that does that as opposed to before you get into the site, I think everything on that website is subject to the SEC reviewing. And so if somebody comes in on a message board or sends in a uh, review or something and talks about the terms of the offering by accident and it's on the website after you let people get into the website, you potentially have a problem. So clients, and this is part of the lawyer's job really more so than what you guys do, but monitoring to make sure that kind of stuff doesn't happen is very important. And then the last tip is whatever information companies give out should be consistent. Don't play favorites. You know, hey, you're a customer of ours, you're a good customer, we're going to tell you a little bit more here. That's just Securities Law 101. You have to be very even-handed about information you hand out. You don't play favorites in the world of securities, because if you do, the SEC comes in and then they throw you in jail, and that's no fun for anybody. All right. These are the questions that Joe sent me that I guess were gathered from the staff, so I'm going to kind of go through these, and uh, I've got six or seven of these, and then we'll be done, and I'll take any questions you have. But number one is, what are the risks of investing? Well, the risks of investing in these types of deals are almost always very high. Um, particularly with Title III, you're going to be talking about a lot of startup companies. There's a good 80%, you know, 60 to 80% failure rate within five years of startup companies in general. So people that are investing in these types of, of deals, they are inherently dangerous investments. They're inherently high-risk investments. That's why the SEC makes every investor check a little box off that says, I understand that I could lose every dime that I'm investing in this on every single investment they do. So as a company, you at least have the assurance that somebody before they gave you 20 bucks or 50 bucks or 100 bucks checked a little box that says, okay, I realize that I could lose this money. But these are going to always be risky investments. Now, with risk comes reward. You know, obviously, if you were able to give Facebook $100 in 2004, you know, that $100 might be worth a million dollars today. So those types of risk-reward benefits are what comes with this, but all crowdfunding, even on Kickstarter, is risky. You know, I mean, you give money to people, and they may not make the product. You know, it's just like anything else. High risk, high reward. <coughs> How does a company become eligible? In each of these situations, there's different eligibility. Um, in Title II, the private placement world, pretty much any company, even foreign companies, can raise money. In Title III, the up to a million dollars, you have to be a U.S. company. In Title IV, the mini IPO, U.S. or Canadian company. You'll notice in each one of these things I said company, which is very important. People can go on Kickstarter and raise money without being a company. So the first thing people need to know is you have to form a company. You're selling stock in a company. You can't go, anybody want to buy 30% of Kendall Almerico? You can't do that. But you can buy 30% of Kendall Almerico LLC, the company that I happen to run or whatever I make up. 
Other than that, there's no financial eligibility. There's no, you have to have been in business for a certain number of years. You have to have so much in assets. None of those things apply. It really is, these laws were created to let almost any company use them if they can actually afford to use them. What kind of company does it work for? This one should be easy for you guys. If it works for rewards-based crowdfunding, it's going to work for Title III or the mini IPO. So if it's, if it's a product that comes in and it's a consumer product and they've already got a fan base or they've got a really cool thing, if they've got a good management team, if they've got a great video, all the same things you guys look for, it's the same thing, okay? The same thing. The one difference is when you're talking about Title II. So when you're just going to accredited investors, keep in mind what I said before. The guys that are getting pitched these deals are getting pitched hundreds of these things. So something needs to make it stand out. And personally, when I invest in companies, the things I look at, number one, I look at the management team. That's to me, the, I invest in, you know, they say invest in the jockey, not the horse. A lot of times I do that. You know, if I see people that I, I look and go, wow, you know, they've created the world's most tasty ice cream, but these people were all car mechanics, I'm not investing in them. You know, on the other hand, if they were from Carvel and Baskin Robbins and, you know, Ben and Jerry's and, you know, these guys know a little bit something about ice cream, you know. So looking at the management team is very important. Now, how important is that in Title III and Title IV where you're going to the general public? My personal feeling is it can be important. You know, if you have a huge name person, if Richard Branson said, I'm starting a new company and I'm going to the crowd to raise money and people recognize Richard Branson because, you know, he's been on the news or whatever, that would help. If you're a guy who started a tech company that you know, became a billion dollar company, but nobody knows your name, I don't know that the average Joe on the street cares. They're more interested in, well, is this a cool company? You know, with BrewDog, for example, I like craft beer. I like their beer. I get to be part of this culture and this community. That's what I want to do. It's the same kind of thing as, you know, so keeping in mind, it depends on what you're raising money for. But when you're going to the general public, the same marketing concepts that you guys always use, will play as to what kind of company it works for. One other thing to keep in mind, and it may not really apply as much to you guys, is Title III, the new law, I have been preaching this for people. I wrote an article in Entrepreneur that if you guys want to look it up, I said there's four different kinds of companies that I really think are great for Title III that most people won't think of. Because you know, the Pebble Watch kind of company, that's an obvious one. But one of the ones I think is very important is like a local business. What was the name of the place we went to lunch at? Saber. So, Awesome burger, great food. Now, if Saver said, you know what, we want to open up a second location here in, you know, Charlotte, but it's, I don't know, the other side of town, and there's a big population base there, and they went to their customer base and said, we need to raise a half million dollars under Title III, and we're going to open this up, and by the way, you're going to own 10% of our company, and you're going to get a coupon for every time you come into the company for, you know, every time you come in for a dollar off your burger for the next year, that's a very small micro-marketing offering that I think you know, people can raise a lot of money to open up a second location of a successful business in a city. Those kinds of things, you know, they're no-brainers. You know, if you have, already have the customer base, already have the people that are excited about you, wait, I get to actually own a little piece of this? You know, then again, most of those companies that fit in that fold probably don't have any trouble raising money privately anyway. But if they wanted to do it, to do it to be smart, to use it not just as let me raise the money, but also let me raise the money and build another 1,500, 2,000 brand ambassadors who are going to be bringing all their family members to the other location of Saver to come and eat because that's where their money is and you got to come to this restaurant. You know, that's the kind of thing that actually can make it work. What's the best way to identify investors? No different than the way that you target people on your rewards campaigns. So again, the same analysis you use as to who would possibly buy this product, who would possibly donate to this product, that doesn't change. You're still going to be micro-targeting the people that you think are the target audience of the product or the business to find the, the investors, especially when you're talking about going to the general public. It's a lot more complicated when you're talking about accredited investors because there you really just have to get to accredited investors. Put the message in front of them and hope they like it. General public, it's no different than marketing like you would on Kickstarter. <clears throat> How long should it take to get funded? In the private placement world, in the Title II world, the average time it takes to get funded is between six and nine months. It's a long process, sometimes a year. The reason for that is you're going to people who aren't going to go on a website, click a button, 
and wire $100,000 to people. Nobody does that, all right? They want to meet the founders. They want to have a phone call with the founders. They want to do research. They want their broker to look at it. They want their lawyer to look at it. They want to negotiate things that are in the paperwork. It's a process. Very few people just click a button online and wire a bunch of money. Now, ultimately, when they're happy, they'll click the button and wire the money. But that process takes time. Um, everyone thought that this online process would speed that up. And I said, no, it won't, because you got the same people that were two years ago insisting on meeting with people and doing all those things. They're not going to change just because they saw a cool video. They're still going to want to do what they've always done for 20 or 30 years. Now, as this generation fades away, you know, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, absolutely, it's going to be a totally different world. People are going to go, I like this. I did all my research. Maybe make a phone call, click the button, and do it. For the next five to 10 years, no chance. So it's a longer process. With Title III, because the numbers are smaller, I think it's going to be just like Kickstarter. The only difference is you don't have that three-month to six-month lead-up to your Kickstarter campaign where you've built the crowd. So build that into the beginning of the offering, and then 30 to 90 days, you should be able to get funded. So you're really probably talking about th you know, four months to six months to get funded because you have to have that period of time. Now, somebody comes to you, and they've already got the build-in crowd to go to, Boom, you should be able to do it in 30 days. You know, should be able to do it in 30 days. Oh, and Title IV, the other one, the 50 million one, most of those are going to stay open for a year. $50 million is a lot of money. <laughs> $50 million is a lot of money to get from people 90, 50, $100 at a time. You know, so you gotta get a lot of people involved. You gotta have an ongoing campaign. I was telling Roy for BrewDog, for example, when they launch in a couple of weeks, they'll have their, you know, big typical, hey, we're launching this thing, hey, let's get some publicity. But Every 30 days for the next year, they will have another event, another media outreach, something else to go to the media because as we all know in this room, I'm preaching to the choir, crowdfunding campaign goes off, you get a bunch of hits, and then it goes like this. And you gotta find something to make it go back up. And normally the only thing people have to make it go back up is either a big media event or campaign's about to close and they start going to people, it's last chance, last chance, last chance. So when you're doing this, it's no different, but. $50 million is a lot different than raising $500,000. So you gotta get a lot more people involved, a lot more people closed. I, I think the average you're gonna see most people do is at least six months and probably six months to a year to close most of those big ones. Do I need an attorney to launch an offering? I love this question. The answer is of course you need a lawyer. <laughs> Obviously you do. No, the, re the reality is you don't, <laughs> I just had to do that. Um, the, re the reality is Let's talk about each one of them. Title II, the private placement, you don't legally, and none of these do you, you know, legally have to hire a lawyer, all right? And lawyers charge ridiculous amounts of money to do things that they shouldn't charge people ridiculous amounts of money to do. The way I bill people is because they end up using our platform, you know, bankroll to do the raise. I don't charge them very much for the legal fees. I basically charge them just enough up front to cover my expenses, whereas other law firms, there was a Article, article that just came out, the average attorney's fees on a Regulation A plus offering is between $100,000 and $150,000 right now in the first year. So I've never charged anybody anywhere near that. You know, but I also know it's going to be on my platform. There's money to be made you know, down the line, so I'm willing to take that risk. Let's talk about the three real quick, and then I'll take questions. Title II, where it's a private placement, there's a document that should be created, it's not legally required, but there's a document that should be created called a PPM or a Private Placement Memorandum. It's basically a big, thick document that lawyers draft that the company gives to someone that's all the reasons you shouldn't invest in the company. It's literally the cover your ass memorandum. It is a big, thick thing of lawyer stuff that says, here's all the risk factors, here's all the bad things that can happen, here's all the reasons why you don't want to invest in the company, and then it talks about how great the company is. Well, the reason you give that to investors in the private placement world is because if the investor loses his money and sues you, you can say, remember this thing that you signed? I said right in here. So one of the things that's in there is our company may not make any money and may go bankrupt. <laughs> I mean, it literally says things like that. We may not follow our business plan. We may not do well. We may not hit our market. You know, you put all these things in there. Now, the reality is accredited investors, very sophisticated, they get these things all the time. Nobody reads the risk factors. They don't even read any of that. They go to two or three things. Maybe they look at the projections, maybe they look at the management team. They just skip over that 30 pages of risk factors because they know it's just in there to cover the company's butt. But a lawyer needs to draft that, all right? 
The reason that you want the lawyer to draft it is, if it's done wrong, you want somebody to go after, okay? You can copy one off the internet and change the names and hope that it's right, but I can assure you, lawyer's gonna do a lot of research to make sure they do it the right way. Title three, do you need a lawyer? This is a really interesting one. That form C that you file to start a Title III campaign is created so that you don't have to have a lawyer. It's really pretty easy to fill out. If anybody ever looks at it, it's, it's a little long, 10 pages or so. But a company could go in, what's your name, how much are you raising, you know, what kind of stock do you have? A company's CFO and a CEO could probably fill that out all by themselves without a lawyer. The problem is there's a section in there called risk factors and disclosures. So the exact same reason you have a lawyer do the PPM for a private, the private placement memorandum, that thick thing, you want that same thing written in that form because again, if it goes wrong and they sue you, you want to be able to say, well, we told you we had these risks. Now, can a company come up with 10 or 12 risk factors themselves by copying other ones that are on other offerings? Yeah. I'll give you a classic example. I was involved with a company once that did business in Brazil, okay? One of the, I had two or three pages of risk factors just about doing business in Brazil that you wouldn't find anywhere else, but you know, the currency fluctuates, the government changes, they take all the people's, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that happens in Brazil. You gotta tell that to investors, right? If you don't tell that to investors and one of those things happens, you get in trouble. So that's the one section that I would encourage people to at least have a lawyer look at and make some suggestions, but it shouldn't cost a lot of money for a lawyer to be involved in the Title III offering. Title IV offering, the mini IPO, that is almost like you're registering as a public company. There is a lot that goes into that. The, the BrewDog filing was 267 pages long, okay? It's a lot of work. It's a ton of work. There's all kinds of things in there, not just all the same disclaimers and all those other things. Nobody should try and do a Title IV offering without a lawyer. That would be literally suicide. It's a terrible idea. So I'll take some questions now. Anybody? Great question. So that's the big question about all crowdfunding. Is there a secondary market and what is it? So secondary market is, l let me kind of explain it in terms because I remember the first time I got asked this question, I was like, oh, that's, that's great. I mean, read the Jobs Act, I was like, there's nothing in here about a secondary market. So secondary market is basically, if you go buy Disney stock right now from Merrill Lynch or E-Trade online, and you want to sell your shares, you can sell them. You just go back to E-Trade and they'll sell your shares for you to somebody else that wants to buy them because it's all traded on an exchange. You can see what the price is. Oh, today it's $50, tomorrow it's, you know, that's the way stocks work. Those are public companies, publicly traded companies. None of these companies are public companies. There is no stock exchange. You don't go online and go, I just bought, you know, these shares in a Title III offering, and now I can go figure out what they're selling for. That doesn't exist. Now, let me go through the three different kinds and tell you what the answer is. With the private placement, with the Title II, where you're just accredited investors, there is no resale of those shares right now, none. You have to wait, it's a wait and hold. You're investing in the company, you're hoping the company either goes public, does an IPO, does something to give you an exit event, but rich people are assumed that they can hold on to this for a long time, it's a long-term investment. So there is no trading of that. Now, after a year, there are places where you can find private buyers and sell and trade. Okay, it can be done but you gotta go back to the company, get permission to do it, it's a very complicated process, all right? Title III has no liquidity of their shares at all. When you sell shares on the, for the new law, the million dollar law, you can't sell them anywhere for at least a year. For one year, you have to hold those shares. After a year, there is nothing in the law that says about what happens to those shares. Nobody knows <laughs> what's going to happen to those shares. One of the big questions in front of the SEC is, what happens after a year? and nobody knows. Most people assume they're treated like the private shares from a Title II thing where you have to hold on to them and if you could find a buyer that's an accredited investor, you could sell them, but no one really knows yet. In Regulation A, the shares are liquid immediate when you sell them. So you go out and raise money, you get your shares, you can go sell them to somebody if you can find a buyer, but there's no marketplace for them yet. Those are being developed, they will be developed, now, what you can do with Regulation A is, I just bought these shares, I want to sell them. You know, you could go on eBay if you wanted to. You could find buyers for them. You could go back to the company and say, you wanna buy them back, or do you know someone that wants to buy them? 
it's possible to sell them. But the magical thing about Regulation A is you can then go and list them on an exchange. So you can take those shares as soon as the offering's closed. Not you, but the company could go on and say, you know, BrewDog could close their offering, say, we got our $50 million, we now have 500,000 investors, now we're going to go list on NASDAQ. And all of a sudden your shares are just like Disney or IBM or whatever. They're traded through online or whatever. One company has done it already. They raised $17 million, took their stock, went to what's called the OTC markets. So they went on, you know, listed their stock. Their stock went from $14 to $70 in about two weeks. Their market cap went up to over a billion dollars. And then their stock went down to 13. <laughs> this is not a good thing. So for most companies that you'll be dealing with, it's not the kind of thing I advise people not to do it. Because what happens is when you become a public company, you stop worrying about growing your company and building your company. You start worrying about managing your stock price. Every quarter, you've got to be out there saying, oh, I did this, and just so your stock price doesn't go crazy. Well, if you're in a young company and you're trying to grow your company, that, that's, a, that's a whole other world. You know, grow your company. Grow sales. Grow revenues. Grow profits. Then hire the people that know how to do that and go public. So to answer your question, no secondary market yet. There are a lot of people developing secondary markets, and a year from now, you'll see them. Any other ones? So if you run like a total for example in the next five or ten years, you say, can you run another one after that? One year. One per you can do it one time per year. Now you could then go and do a regulation A offering, or you could do a private placement, mm -hmm. but you can only do one Title Three campaign per year, per calendar year. What about the other ones? The other ones pretty much well, private placements, you can do as many of those as you want. As soon as you close one down, you can start another one. You could do 10 of them in a year if you wanted to. There's no restriction on those, the Title II. Regulation A is the same thing, one per year. Couldn't you run it one year too, but not one year from the year you start yeah. it? One year from the year you start it. So it's not like, okay, so yeah, it's 12-month period. Month period. Yeah, I'm sorry. You, you, yeah, if you started in June, you could do another one the next July. Okay. Yeah, it's not, oh, you did one in 2012. Now you can't do the one in, no, it's not like that. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's probably a better way to say it. So like, Yes. What opportunities do you think there are for any type of equity crowdfunding for both private placement deals? It, it's going to depend on whether, first of all, companies, one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to get people that come in and say, you know, I get asked this question all the time, and what I try to explain to people is because it's so new and nobody really knows for sure what's going to happen, the opportunity to raise more money with the exact same work that you guys do is much greater with equity crowdfunding. It costs more to do, but it's much greater because you're not just looking at people that want to buy the product. You're looking at people that, the same people that want to buy the product are going to buy the product, just add on a few shares to it. Now you've got people that are going, I want to invest also. So the same people that would go in and say, I want that product, if they're getting the product and some shares in a Regulation A offering, they're going to do the shares. But then you're going to get people that are more interested in, I like this company, I want to invest in this company. They're not going to just say, let me give you $150 for the watch. They're going to say, let me give you $1,500 because I want 10 shares of the company plus the watch. So the amount of money you can raise should be remarkably bigger for the same amount of... Now, your question was outside of those people. Right now, it's going to be very hard for any company that doesn't have a customer base to raise money using these things. If you don't have a customer base or some big... I, mean, I think films could do this all day, you know? Do they have a built-in customer base? No. But I think if a celebrity comes out and goes, I'm going to make a movie like Zach Bramp did or Veronica Mars or something like that and says, I'm going to use Regulation A and I want to raise $20 million to finance this film, I think they could do it in a heartbeat. Okay? They don't have a physical product, but it's you know, the same kind of thing as Kickstarter. Outside of that, unless you have a customer base or a fan base or a user base, it's going to be very difficult. You know, if I wanted to open up a consulting business, no one's going to invest in it. You know, I, I don't have anything sexy to sell anybody. Now, if I've been consulting and I've had 100,000 satisfied customers for years, and I go, I'm going to open a new consulting business, I could go to those people, I could raise money. You know? So it really just comes down to the same kind of metrics of, is there a crowd? If there's not a crowd, I'm not saying it won't work for other businesses. That's where you guys come in. You know, there may be something that's really an awesome business idea. You know, I, I say this a lot of times when I'm speaking. I go, you know, someone could come up with the coolest brand new algorithm that Google would want to buy and pay a billion dollars for because it's incredible what it does to search engines. 
it would be the hardest thing in the world to crowdfund because how the hell would you explain that to people? On the other hand, creative marketing campaign that goes, Google wants to buy this from us for a billion dollars, or this is the kind of thing that gets bought for a billion dollars, and you get out to the right people in the right press, you could do that. You know, you could make that marketed. So it would just take incredibly creative marketing on your behalf to be able to build a crowd around or excitement around something that's not a sexy product. I don't think it's gonna work in most cases. You know, most, I get phone calls all the time. People tell me, I wanna raise money, I wanna do this, I wanna crowdfund it. It's not gonna work. Not saying it can't be built. You wanna spend a million dollars on marketing to try and build a crowd? If you got a million dollars to spend on marketing, let's give it a shot. If you don't, probably not gonna happen. You know, so. But I think anything, ultimately, you can build a crowd for if it's the right thing. It's just not gonna be easy. They can do it, no, it doesn't matter. Okay. And, they, and they can do a rewards campaign at the same time. You know, I mean, it really, it, you can do all these, it, you know, any order you wanna do them, you just can't do them at the same time, okay? But you can go one to the other, you don't have to go through a progression or anything like that. And the rewards thing tying in, you know, if you wanted to do a rewards campaign and then do another one or do a rewards, the problem there is mixing the marketing message. You know, where are you gonna direct people? Are you gonna send them to Kickstarter? Are you gonna send them over here? You know, so it really makes sense from a marketing standpoint to just do one thing, but you could do, we combine, I'm always telling people, let's combine rewards with the equity because you're getting the best of both worlds. Why not throw in, you know, brew dog? Why not throw in, hey, you're getting, you know, a free beer on your birthday and a free, you know, it's just more things people are gonna wanna invest for. You mentioned the cap in terms of the investment allotment of a certain good amount of whatever it is. Is that based on the individual offering? They can invest up to X amount of percent or is that only in the year? In and I think it's Title III, I gotta look at it. I'm almost sure Title III, it's, a, it's an amount that you can invest per individual offering, but I think, I'll have to get back to you, I gotta look it up. I think in Title IV, it's over the course of the year in all offerings. One of those has a cap that's for all offerings, but I'll, I'll have to look it up and tell you, because I'm not sure. I mean, right now, no one's ever had that happen, so it's one of those things where like, oh, oh an interest, it's actually, it is Title III, so I did, now that I think about it, because I remember this issue, I came up with the SEC when I wrote my comment letter to them. It's with Title III, you're, you're, there's a cap on the amount you can invest in all Title III offerings over the course of a year. That cap actually applies to that. If it's 10% of your income, that's over the course of a year for all offerings. However, there's no database out there. If you went on one website and put money in and another website and put money in, they don't have to share data. There's no centralized database. There's no way to enforce it. I don't, and that was one of the questions I had for the SEC when they were writing the rules was, how do you enforce this if you're a funding portal? How do you know if somebody's gone on another site? Where do I look this up? There is no database. So basically what people do to cover their ass, if you're a funding portal, check a box that says you have not invested more than X on another funding portal. Click, you know, that's, that's what we're doing. That's a good question. Anything else? But how would, if you're an investor, how would they treat it from a tax standpoint? The same way any other investment would be treated. If you went and bought you know, shares through Merrill Lynch of anything, that's, it's a, you know, if you sell it and make money, capital gains tax. If you're investing in something through Title III or Title II or Title IV, it's just an investment. There's no, you know, the same tax benefit of any stock that you would buy anywhere else. There's really no magical, no benefit. You know, you don't get to write it off on your taxes. I'm not a tax attorney and I'm not giving tax advice, but you don't get to say, I invested in this and therefore, you know, I get some kind of tax credit. If you lose the money, it depends on whether or not you're allowed to write off that loss as a business loss or a tax loss. You know, you'd have to talk to your, uh, you know, accountants to know that. But there's no magical formula like, hey, we want to encourage people to invest in this, so if you invest in a Title III campaign, you get a tax, there's nothing like that. And for the companies, that's kind of the same question. I, you know, people have asked me this a lot of times. I raise money on Kickstarter. Is that taxable income? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, if, if you're taking money from someone, there are tax ramifications to that. Now, does that mean it's the same as somebody buying something? Well, I mean, there's a lot of nuances there. But people that are raising money, you know, generally are spending the money as part of their business. So there's a offset there, and they don't really have taxable income. But there's been more than one story of companies got hit with tax bills because they didn't think about paying taxes on monies they raised through Kickstarter. Very similar process here, you know, for a company. Oh, they are. Oh yeah, this is very real, you know. 
what happens is when you get through the process to the end, there's usually what we call a transfer agent that's involved. So there's a company that manages the stock for the company that raised the money. And they will send out, you know, if you're issuing stock certificates, they'll send out stock certificates. If there's, at the end of the year, there's a K-1 that's issued, just like, or a 1099, you know, I mean, anybody that owns stocks, you get, you know, broker at the end of the year sends you a thing that says, here's how much money you made and how much money you lost on this stock, 1099Q or R or whatever it is, you'll definitely get one of those for this too. It's, uh, it's interesting. I think it's very bright. I think it's going to be a very slow adaptation. Uh, we've already seen that. The fact that Regulation A has been out for a year, there's been 103 filings, 44 were qualified by the SEC. I think only 14 actually went live. And probably of those, four or five raised a lot of money. Um, by a lot of money, I mean more than you know $500,000. So for a year, it's taken a long time to do things. But there hasn't been a big mass commercial product. Elio Motors was probably the closest to that. But it's a specialized you know, three-wheeled car thing that, unless you're into the automotive world or something, probably didn't even read about it or know about it. Well, they raised $17 million. But you know, it's still a pretty specialized product. It's going to take one of two things. It's either going to take somebody who just blows the doors off of the marketing world, which something like BrewDog could do, that kind of brings it into the vernacular of everybody because it's beer. Everybody knows about beer. Or what we're going to see, I can assure you, within the next 12 months, some well-known company that already has a well-known product out there is going to look at Regulation A and say, I can go raise 20 or $25 million from my customer base that I've had for five years, my millions of customers, let them own a piece of my company, and do something really cool to launch a new product. When that happens, and it'll have to be a private company that does it, it can't be you know, Mattel or someone like that, but when someone does that, then everyone's going to know about it. They're going to realize it. So that's going to happen. I know for a fact there are a couple of very large companies that are talking about doing just that. So. You know, it's got to be the right company with the right product and the right thing. But once you see something mainstream like that happen, and Title III is the same thing. I mean, think about Kickstarter. They launched in 2008 or 9. The Pebble Watch was really the first big deal. That was 2011. Okay, so they were around for three years before there was a huge, huge success. And even then, it took them a couple years to really get to the point where they were, you know, iconic. So Title III started 60 days ago, you know. It's been not a good track record for 60 days, but that doesn't surprise me. You know, these companies are out there trying to raise money without having any ability to pre-market. You know, so the next round that comes out that understands the rules, you'll start to see some traction. And I think it's going to be a boon for you guys because I think in the next two or three years, it's going to become huge. I really, I've been saying this for a long time. Now that all the rules are out, I really think what's going to happen is people are going to go for the right kind of product. First thing they're going to do is a rewards campaign. They're going to come to you and they're going to do a Kickstarter campaign. And then they're going to say, well, that worked. Now we have all these backers. Hmm, I wonder if those people would like to invest in the company. Then they're going to do a Title III campaign if they only need a million dollars. If they need more, they'll do a Title IV campaign. I think that's going to start happening all the time. And then you'll get people to the point where they then are ready for a real IPO or they'll be ready to go in you know, the venture capital route or they're already making enough money where they don't need more funding. But I think you're going to see that as be the normal process as this goes forward. So rewards crowdfunding is not going anywhere. It's just going to get bigger. Equity crowdfunding is going to step in for the next round for almost everybody because banks are never going to start lending money. And the VCs have moved way out of the space now. They're not talking to companies that are at that level. You know, it, it's, it's going to work. But they've got to fix some of these laws. <laughs> this marketing thing is absurd. There was a, uh, just to give you a little example, last week, this is kind of funny. Law was passed in 2012. The law said by January 1st, 2013, the SEC has to release these rules to let people use the law. I'm talking about Title III. Okay? January 1st, 2013, I'm kind of online waiting, wondering what's going on. Nothing. Another year goes by, nothing. Another year goes by, nothing. Another year goes by, nothing. And finally, four years, five months, and six days later, the law comes out. Two and a half years into this, the guy who introduced the law, Representative McHenry from North Carolina, um, submitted a new law called Jobs Act 2.0. Said, we know there's a lot of problems with this law. It's not even in effect yet. Let's 
fix the law before it goes into effect. Well, it got shooed away. People are like, what are you, crazy? We haven't even seen what happens. Last week, this law went into effect in May. Last week, McHenry got a, a bill through the House subcommittee unilaterally. The House voted on it last week. It passed the House bilaterally with no problem. It's in front of the Senate right now to fix some of the problems that are in the law. So there's going to be changes. The marketing is not part of it, but they're talking about raising the cap up to $5 million, which would be great. They're talking about letting people test the waters with Title III campaigns, which would be much better for Title III than it is for, you know. There's a, and one of the other things from a legal standpoint, they're building in the ability to put in a, what we call a special purpose vehicle where you can take all of the investors and put them into one LLC that invests in the company. So you don't have 100,000 people listed on a cap table. Um, it means nothing to most people, but venture capitalists hate going to a company to invest in if there are 100,000 investors. They don't want to do it. But if all those 100,000 investors just show up on the cap table as investor LLC, you know, whatever, and they're all in one little place. So that's one of the legal things that, you know, the lawyers were pretty pissed off about that we weren't allowed to do that's in the new law. So they're, they're fixing it as it goes along. Anything else? Thank you, Daddy. Can you say something quickly with the new law? Let's say the five point thing is all over. Real estate's done great. Mm -hmm. So real estate has been the, the benchmark for crowdfunding. I mean, it's done phenomenally well. Uh, it's developed into its own industry all on its own. Um, there is no question that Title III and Title IV are great for real estate. Um, there was a Title IV campaign in Portland, Oregon that uh, really cool company called Gorilla Construction, I think is their name, it's Gorilla something. And these guys build these funky looking buildings that are just awesome looking, really cool. And they built three or four of these in Portland. They're small office buildings, but they're really kind of funky and cool. And so they did a Title IV campaign. They said we need to raise $750,000. They just marketed it in Oregon, just in Portland. And their whole campaign was own a piece of the office building in your neighborhood. That's all they did. They raised $750,000 in like 30 days from average everyday people for this coolest held building. It just looks really cool. So these kinds of things will you know, continue to happen and there's a whole lot of different ways to do it. Products, by all means, you know, a company with a product, the same things that work on Kickstarter, those are going to be home runs. Everything else is in another area. You know, if you don't have a crowd, you know, I think arts, no one's tried a film you know, yet. I've got a, a client that's, you know, Grammy Award winning client who's talking about doing this to finance her next tour and next album, you know. No one's done that yet, we're gonna try. <laughs> so it, it's all, all the stuff that's happened on Kickstarter, now people are trying to go over here and do this, but you've also got the opportunity to do things for things that don't work on Kickstarter. It's just how good can you guys handle the market, that's what it comes down to.